<clears throat> okay, I will go with Anthony for first. Um, um, Anthony Jose is associate professor at the University of Maryland. Um, he's um, <clears throat> a National Academy of Science uh, uh, Cavalry Fellow. Um, his lab studies living systems to me. Uh, in 2020, uh, the lab uh, <clears throat> uh, was in the news because they developed a potentially revolutionary uh, framework for heredity and evolution uh, in which hered inheritable information could be stored outside the genome. And this would change the way we think of DNA. So I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Um, and I'll introduce Professor Sato later. So, Anthony, it's your show. Uh, you can share your screen. Um, I will uh, kill my video and my audio uh, to give you maximum bandwidth, and I'm asking Curtis to do the same. And we'll have questions later. Okay, the okay. moment you're okay, I mute myself. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Piero, for that very kind introduction and this opportunity to uh, share with everyone some of our work on thinking about heredity. So organisms develop from single cells. And if you look at the single cells, they have DNA within them. But that's not it alone, because they look very different even to your eyes. And how do we think about everything other than DNA, or in addition to DNA, that ensures that these organisms develop uh, and become very different looking, like the sea urchin, the mouse, and the uh, seaweed. So to start thinking about this, we need a really simple organism that you can analyze. And this one millimeter long um, nematode, C. elegans, is really perfect for this. So it is most of the time a hermaphrodite. It can also be uh, male sometimes. And in these hermaphrodites, the oocytes are made in assembly line on either side. They get fertilized by sperm here and then become embryos that are held in utero for a while before they are laid. And the time to go from an adult animal to an adult progeny is just three days, which means you can look across generations and understand what's happening across generations a lot easier. And the other thing you'll notice in the worm is the worm looks quite transparent. And that is another plus because we can put in fluorescent uh, proteins, and then watch what happens to the genes encoding the fluorescent proteins of, over time. So in these three days, um, the development is pretty stereotyped. The one cell embryo can continue to develop and give you a uh, worm that hatches just when you incubate the embryo at the right temperature. So if you were to sum up what's happening in C. elegans development as you go from one generation to the next, you have the sperm and egg starting this initial generation, and then you have a stereotype lineage that gives you somatic cells and also the germline, which generates sperm and oocytes that would fuse to give you the subsequent generation. Okay, so all of that is happening in just uh, three days, which makes it really a useful system. Now, when we expressed uh, genes for two fluorescent proteins, a red one, M-cherry, and a green one, GFP, uh, we stumbled onto something that was really illuminating. So when you have animals that have this transgene that we are calling T, if we took males of those animals and then you mated them with hermaphrodites, something really surprising happened in progeny. Some of the animals, each depicted with the rectangular box here, showed gene silencing for both the red and the green gene. And not only that, if you picked any of those animals, the silencing could remain stable for more than 250 generations. This silencing, which we're calling mating-induced silencing, has been really useful for us to figure out um, how heredity works. And what I'm going to present to you is really only one particular set of observations that nevertheless forces us to think about heredity in a whole new way. So we took the silenced gene called IT here, I for inactive, 
and then now exposed it to other genes that have similar sequence, mCherry or mCherry Delta Pi, where a class of small RNAs can no longer now bind to mCherry. This class of small RNAs are called pi RNAs. If you did this exposure and then you looked at the subsequent generations, what we see is that there is silencing from the silenced transgene transferred to what was already being expressed. We could call this trans silencing. But then following subsequent generations, we see really interesting things that are not easily explained. So here's us first exposing the genes to IT. And then in the initial generations, you're seeing silencing. But then after that initial silencing, you see that only in the cases where the M cherry sequence and the silenced version are present together, you have the silencing persisting essentially forever. But if you remove the IT sequence, then the M cherry expression starts recovering and fewer and fewer animals show this gene silencing. Same is true for M cherry delta pi. But then here's this very interesting case where if you have both the IT and the M cherry delta pi, the IT continues to be silenced, but the M cherry delta pi is now back on. So that means you have susceptibility to this gene silencing that is remaining stable forever. You have recovery from the gene silencing and you even have resistance. So standard ideas of it's something to do with the DNA don't work here because the DNA is pretty much the same throughout. And you're having pretty complicated behavior here that we need to explain. So what I'd like you take you I'd like to take you through is the, our journey in trying to abstract what might be going on, uh, and then use the abstractions to create some simulations to try to understand um, some principles, and then finally apply it to try to explain this single piece of data. Okay, so I'll take you through the process, beginning with the abstraction first. So first, we can think from first principles. If you had any gene that is being expressed, the first thing that you need is to recreate that expression from generation to generation. All the regulators, the gene regulators that are acting on that gene need to be recreated also. And it doesn't matter if the regulators are positive or negative, they all need to be part of some sort of positive feedback loop to make sure that the recreation is happening again and again. So here's a depiction of that feedback loop. You can see that the black, um, uh, circles and arrows form a circle that is summarized here. And for any given gene, you could have positive feedback loops that are composed of positive regulators or negative regulators, right? In either case, both need to be recreated in the next generation. So these interactions then form a pattern which we could refer to as the regulatory architecture that is underlying the expression pattern of a gene in every generation. So for this talk, I'll be referring to it as regulatory architectures. So how different can these regulatory architectures be? In principle, they can be extremely complex, but we can start with the basics. If there's some molecule inside a cell, we know that that molecule by itself can't remain forever. It'll get diluted out or degraded. So the simplest architectures then would need at least two molecules that are somehow supporting each other. Here's a listing of all possible architectures. And of these, you can see there's only one that's heritable where X promotes Y and Y promotes X. For these purposes, X and Y as two regulators can be considered as equivalent. So if we simply list what are the possible heritably regulatory uh, regulated architectures for even the fewest number of entities here, just one to four, you see that these numbers increase pretty dramatically, which means also the information content of any one regulatory architecture uh, also increases really dramatically as measured in bits. Okay, so there's a lot of information outside of just the genome sequence in these architectures. So we can list the basic uh, simplest heritable regulatory architectures you can imagine. Conveniently, there are 26. So you could think of them as A through Z here. And one of the striking features that'll jump out is you'll see there are green arrows going into every node. And that's a basic requirement to make sure that some entity just persists 
across generations. Otherwise, it'll get diluted or degraded. And anytime you have negative regulation, for example, as indicated by these magenta bars, that needs to be balanced with the positive regulation. Otherwise, it will not, the entity will not persist over time. So starting with this basic alphabet, we can then imagine how can any change happen in these regulatory architectures? And you can sort of systematically enumerate them and you see uh, that there are simple architectures like this A architecture, which can arise with a very high frequency by losing one entity. And there are other architectures like C and T, which will arise very rarely, only through particular changes in the regulatory interactions or loss of one regulatory interaction. So this complicated picture probably underlies the frequency with which you would find these different architectures in nature. So in nature, we can't really understand what's going on until we actually perturb the system and then figure out um, some observations and from that infer what might be going on. And this is quite complicated and we can be misled very easily. So let's consider the very simple observation. You reduce X and you see increase in Y. The easiest observation that you, uh, inference that you'd have is that X inhibits Y. That's why you take away X and Y goes up. But then an alternative could be that Y actually activates X, which competes with the auto activation of Y via Z, all right? So how do we distinguish between these two? It's not easy, you need more experiments. So this sets up the fundamental problem where we are dealing with something really complex like a living system. We're trying to perturb it, trying to understand how it works, but we do not have really good ways of knowing for sure exactly how it works. Um, and thinking about how change could propagate in the living system, let's begin with what has been uh, sort of the mainstay in biology, which is the central dogma, where DNA sequence gets converted by transcription into RNA, and then from RNA you have by translation protein. Now, if you introduce a change in DNA, which is the most common way that living systems are perturbed, that change is expected to be propagated to RNA and then to protein. But in addition to that, that change in DNA could affect other RNAs that are binding to DNA sequences or other proteins that are binding to that DNA sequence. Similarly, the change in the RNA sequence could also affect interaction to other parts of DNA or other proteins that bind to it. In the same way, the protein also could have changes in other RNAs that bind to it and other places of DNA that bind to it. Now, if you look at this picture, there are lots of interacting loops that have arisen. And the real control here is not in the DNA. It is very decentralized, okay? So how these changes are propagated across the system is hard to imagine. It's like, if you know of the game Jenga, where you remove one tile and everything collapses in some particular way. So that can happen inside living systems in ways that are hard to predict. Not only that, an even bigger challenge is living systems are incredibly complex. This is a cutaway view of a cell highlighting only some of the parts of the cell in different colors. Looks like a Jackson Pollock painting, right? So how do we think about everything that's in here and how it's being regulated? So we can imagine three different aspects that are absolutely necessary for imagining how regulation is um, happening inside these living systems. So those are entity, sensor, and property. The details are in these books that Piero referred to in the beginning, in these uh, three um, papers, I mean, that Piero referred to in the beginning. But for this talk, let's just imagine entities are something that is being measured inside the cell. Sensor are other things that are doing the measuring. And what they're measuring are some attribute of the entity called property. Now, with just these three, you can start imagining the regulatory architectures that could arise inside cells. Here's an illustration of the total number of such regulatory architectures that could be present in one cell. And what is being illustrated here are particular properties that are being measured. For example, maybe this pointiness is being measured by this sensor, uh, the con um, vexity is being measured by this sensor and the concavity is also being measured by the, the sensor. 
So in this way, you could imagine inside the cell, there are many properties that are being measured by many different sensors, leading to very many different regulatory architectures that are possible, okay? With that abstraction then, we can again go back and see, well, with all that complexity within which these two genes are meeting each other, how do we understand what might be going on to explain this phenomena? So we can start simulating these entity sensor property systems. So here's a basic depiction of how we are going to simulate the entity sensor property systems. Here, the entity or sensor is indicated by these circles that are in different colors. The size of the circle gives you the numbers of those entities or sensors. We need to make some simplifications, of course. And we are showing the steps in which these entities will change. For example, maybe there's an RNA inside the cell and the RNAs are getting made in 10 molecules at a time, then the delta property, the step with which they change will be 10. And the next number is the active fraction, which means if there are hundred molecules that are in there, not all hundred of them are active at all times. This accounts for processes like folding or getting to the right place for interacting with other molecules through diffusion or transport, et cetera. And finally, of course, the number is also depicted. The links that you see here are, can be either positive regulatory links or negative regulatory links, and they are depicted with gray and black. And the thickness indicates the ease with which you could transmit a change. So if this entity changes, how easily can it transmit that information to the uh, other entity? That's indicated by a thick line, if it is easy, and thin line, if it is hard. Um, and finally, we also have, uh, oops, I think I went one over, yeah. So we can also simulate the cell division that happens by having, after every two time steps, roughly dividing the regulatory architectures. Okay, so you can consider that as either cell division or one generation. So here's the same regulatory architecture from the last slide. Here's the initial time point, generation one. And then if you wait a while, there's generation three. You can see some things have changed. And if you look at any one generation, the relative sizes of these circles being plotted here, you can think of that as the phenotype or the appearance of the cell. And this is very similar to what you might do molecularly by measuring all the RNAs that are um, in a cell during an RNA um, sequencing experiment. So this is the relative abundance of the RNAs that you're seeing. Now, as you go through from one time point to another, you can see that the relative amounts can change. And yet the architecture is the same from generation one to generation three, which means there can be variability between cells, but the underlying driving architecture that is uh, determining how the cell looks is still the same, okay? So um, you can make a simulation and then play with it for a while. So I'll show you um, some of it to give you a flavor of this. This is the uh, simulation here, some complicated architecture that you can create arbitrarily. And then you can make, run it for a while it lost some entity and you can see the relative abundance of the various entities plotted here. Seems to be stable for a while and then I made one more thing go away and now it's even simpler. You could set the same architecture up again and this time maybe go in and change something else, some other node. And now you have this architecture that seems to persist for a while. You can then go in and take one more away and you would get um, that change still persisting as this different architecture. And after a while, you can take one more away and you'll be left with um, another simpler architecture that has only two. So these would all be the kinds of changes that can happen in a cell without um, being easily observable from the outside. Um, that means all the... Um, uh, changes that are happening within the regulatory architectures uh, need to be systematically analyzed. And then when we did that, uh, we found really there are two broad classes that we can imagine. The classes of architectures where if you took any one entity and you reduced its levels 
to say by twofold as shown here for quite a few generations, the entire architecture can still bounce back without any entity going to zero. Or you can have situations where if you reduce one of the entities by twofold, you now have an altered architecture that now persists. And these types of reduction experiments are really similar to gene silencing that I uh, talked about at the beginning. So getting back to that very same experimental result, now we can see, can we with these intuitions try to apply and understand what might be going on here? Uh, so to remind everyone again, we are trying to understand susceptibility, recovery, and resistance, which are the behaviors we observe in the lab when we expose a silenced copy of the gene to an expressing copy of another gene. So we are now trying to apply this. So I'll give you some more details about what has been figured out in the field about how this silencing is happening. As expected, the silencing does require a positive feedback loop for it to be maintained for many generations. And the positive feedback loop relies on antisense RNAs called 22 G RNAs, which are bound by a protein called HRD1. This leads to the cleavage of RNA transcripts, which can get stabilized by the addition of dinucleotides, UG dinucleotides here. And those stabilized RNAs then become templates for making more antisense 22 G RNA that'll go on to bind more HRD1 and the cycle can continue across generations. Now we can simplify this to say this whole thing is a loop that is dependent on HRD1, which is the same as also saying, this is a loop where the production of two experimentally measurable RNA intermediates, the poly UG RNA or PUG RNA and the 22 G RNAs promoting each other. So with that view then, we can try to simulate what should happen here and just apply some of the basic things that we have uh, learned through the um, simulation so far. So we can depict the change of these poly-UG RNAs and 22G RNAs as coupled differential equations shown here, and then simulate what would happen to see what, happen, uh, what uh, we can learn from this. The dotted lines here are levels below which the silencing would be lost. So you need these molecules to do the silencing. What happens if you now go in and reduce the 22 G RNAs by some amount? Maybe after that short reduction, it will recover back. And if the lines, the solid lines are above the dotted lines, that means the silencing still continues. But clearly, if you if you were to perturb it for a longer period or to perturb it stronger, then the recovery can now be below the dotted line, which means now the extent of silencing is not detectable or gone. And so you could have recovery and even resistance. So with these ideas, if we go back to the results that we had, we can now propose a specific model that what's happening is you have these HRD1 dependent loops that are silencing these genes. And when there is a pi RNA binding site, like when there is M cherry that is also present, then you can have silencing that lasts for a long time because this silencing is enhanced by pi RNA binding. But when that is not there, you can have recovery and potentially resistance because over time, this is getting weakened. A further insight that came from this using results in the literature that I'm not talking about is that there are sensors among the genes that are regulated genome-wide by these pi RNAs. And these sensors must be promoting this HRD1 loop. So over time, the hope is work in the field by us and others in the lab, uh, others in the field will uh, test these hypotheses. So I want to step back and discuss a little bit about how to um, make sense of heredity and how we really make sense of anything. Uh, we take discoveries and then we try to model them and we model them based on some underlying theory. So for example, if we were to consider these numbers as the discoveries that we make and we model them based on some underlying theory as A times B is proportional to C, it seems to work. Multiplication seems to explain what we are observing, but you can have a new discovery like three or eight here. Now multiplication doesn't work anymore 
But if we adjust the theory, we may be able to explain everything again. For example, if we think of A power B here, that seems to work here. So the way we have been thinking about heredity in the past has been focused on gene sequences and epigenetic markers and trying to model genome plus epigenome as an explanation for heredity is inadequate for some of the results that I have uh, presented today. The underlying theory being the central dogma where the DNA is still thought of as really controlling, okay? Um, but what we have are homeostatic maintenance mechanisms that make sure the form and function of every organism looks pretty similar in successive generations. And we also have heritable epigenetic changes that can happen and last for hundreds of generations. These processes require a different explanation where you must take into account the interactions between entities that are inside cells. And these interactions are really ubiquitous and varied. So I talked about one way in which we can account for these interactions through entity sensor property systems. And the underlying theory here is thinking about the interactions that are happening in addition to information carried in DNA sequence, where the control is really decentralized. So if you took uh, any textbook, they would often begin with heredity because of how central it is to understanding what a living system really is. They would begin by saying there are many different single-celled uh, uh, beginnings that lead to different organisms, but then they would say all cells store their hereditary information in similar DNA molecules as genome sequences. I hope I have uh, given you an additional way to think about this where there's of course the information in the genome sequence, but also there is information in diverse entity sensor property systems that are being transmitted across generations. So I'd like to thank uh, everyone in the lab who I have discussed with and for all the experimental work that they have uh, done that undergirds some of the things I talked about. The work I presented has benefited a lot from long discussions with uh, Tom, my colleague, with whom I'm expanding these ideas for wider application. Um, and also PE, who is a mathematician with whom I'm expanding uh, the uh, math required for determining if anything can be heritable or not. And I'd like to thank the funding agencies, NIH and NSF, and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Very, very exciting ideas here. Um, <clears throat> you have a question from the audience, but let me let me rephrase it in my own terms. Oh, first, okay. let me ask you actually something I... <clears throat> I always wonder about. Uh, obviously, the the nematode, this very teeny worm, is very popular uh, mm -hmm. among uh, to do this kind of research. Mm -hmm. um, so I understand uh, <clears throat> the advantage is that you can easily observe and monitor changes, right? That's yeah. uh, ultimately. Yeah. But I also understand that this is an organism with one thousand cells, right? Right. Yeah. Nine fifty nine. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know how many cells there are in the human body, but obviously a lot more. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. So, so are we sure that experiments we perform on such a simple organism apply also to a frog, a chicken, and eventually to a human being? Yes, very good question. And I think I would say, you know, there are famous statements like what is true for E. coli is true for the elephant by Monod that has been said before. Uh, but I would argue that uh, at a minimum, there should be information that is like this entity sensor property and genome that is transmitted. But in the case of humans, there's definitely more than this because you have gestation and placental communication. And so what additional information gets transmitted even beyond what I've said uh, now depends on how complex the life cycle is for the organism. So in a pregnant woman with a female fetus is actually communicating across two generations because the female fetus is already developing the oocyte for the next generation. So I would say this is the baseline. We need genome sequence. We need entity sensor property systems and humans probably have even more beyond this. So the question from the audience is about the simulation. 
Um, and, and I'm also curious, what, what tools do you use to mathematically simulate uh, what goes on? Oh. Okay, so the, this is new for me. I've, uh, I'm not a mathematician by training. I'm a mathematician by affinity and lack of talent. But uh, what, what I used was this um, uh, software called NetLogo that was developed by Uri Walensky from uh, Northwestern. It's really a um, low base for entry and high ceiling for uh, things you can do with it. So you, you still have to write a program, you know, some level of uh, Python programming or uh, any basic programming is useful. Uh, and then it has a very good user interface where you can play with it quite a bit and even analyze systematically. So that's what I used. And um, <clears throat> um, so you, <clears throat> you introduced this theory a few years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. So far, what has been the reaction from uh, from your peers from from the world uh, of uh, genetics? Mm -hmm. uh, I would say uh, it's mixed. The people I've had uh, conversations at length with uh, agree there's clearly something more, and we need some way of looking at it. Uh, and I think uh, over time we will figure out if uh, concrete predictions, like the one that I talked about in today's talk get validated later. Because one of the problems is there are many different ways in which you can look at any complex system. Uh, and really the best way um, will, will be figured out when we can predict some things and validate it later. So um, that's that's the interaction uh, that has and feedback that has been uh, there so far. Basically time will tell if we are able to get useful things out of this. I see. So that brings me to the final question. I see you have a lab of about 10, 12 people. <clears throat> what are they working on? What's what's the next step for your lab? Oh, um, we're working on a wide range of uh, things, including RNA transport between cells. But for this particular um, line of work that I talked about, uh, one of the exciting things that we'd like to figure out is what is so special about this gene that we were able to turn it off and have it be off for hundreds of generations. Whereas if you try some other genes, this doesn't happen. So that means we should be able to get to the core principles that allow some genes to be really susceptible to environmental interference and multi-generational effects and other genes to be really robust and come back so that we maintain our form and function. So experimentally, we are trying to go after that in the lab. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we should also mention that this is not just a theoretical, uh, <clears throat> it's not just philosophy. I mean, uh, this has an impact on uh, diseases that we study and we study assuming a certain, what you call the, the dogma. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Right now, when you say what is a heritable disease, people are looking at genome sequencing uh, to find out is there a mutation. But you can get heritable diseases in many different ways, and that's one of the obvious things that this brings up. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Piro. I had just a real quick question, if I if I may. Oh. I was wondering, is there? Um, I was wondering if these small RNAs and things like that, whether these systems represent something, another way that could be co-opted by viruses. In yes, terms absolutely. Of interfering with, uh, right. with right. cell replication and heredity, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Great segue to your talk, I imagine. Uh, but uh, RNA interference, which is the uh, phenomenon that was discovered where if you inject double-stranded RNA, you can turn off genes of matching sequence uh, that is thought to be an antiviral mechanism in cells because viruses, when they replicate, go through a double-stranded RNA phase. So during that time, cells can recognize something's up. You know, uh, Of course, I'm speaking in an anthropomorphic way. All that it means is when there is a double-stranded RNA, cells have evolved to perform certain chemical reactions that will shut down the expression of that whatever gene is associated with the double-stranded RNA. Yes, absolutely. Very cool. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat>